Welcome everyone to the second webinar of the Fundamentals of Restorative Justice series hosted by the South Carolina Restorative Justice Initiative. As you all know, my name is Aparna Polavarapu, and I'm the executive director and founder of SCRJI, as well as an associate professor of law at the University of South Carolina School of Law. I am thrilled today to be joined by uh, Sujatha Balaga and Chris Godsey, both of whom will be speaking about how they implement restorative approaches when working with people involved with intimate partner violence. Because of the nature of this discussion and the fact that uh, we may start getting into some more specific details in this conversation, I want to remind you that this will be recorded and posted for a limited time on the website. If you need some time to step away from the subject matter, from this conversation, please do so um, and return to it at a later time. This will be here for some time. Now, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to um, both of our speakers by asking you to briefly introduce yourselves and speak about how you implement restorative approaches when addressing intimate partner violence. And I'm going to start with Sujatha. Thank you so much, uh, Aparna, for having uh, us uh, talk about this uh, issue very close to my heart. Uh, and uh, so um, I'd like to start with, uh, as someone who is deeply influenced by indigenous uh, thinkers, just really briefly to acknowledge that I am speaking to you uh, from occupied land. And so um, it, it feels particularly important to say that all the time. But um, but especially when I'm talking about restorative justice and so much of what I've learned has come from indigenous people. And so I'm speaking to you from what was Chichonio Ohlone land um, that was never ceded. And so uh, I just wanted to start with, with naming that. And so my name is Sujata Balaga and um, a brief introduction, I would say that uh, some of the more important things to know about how it is that I came to the work of restorative justice is that um, I myself am a survivor of intrafamilial sexual violence um, and domestic violence, uh, growing up with emotional abuse uh, from my father as well as sexual abuse. And that is what brought me to this work uh, very much. So I became a victim advocate first and um, really aspired to become a prosecutor, thinking that um, I would be the kind of person who would uh, make the system um, more, uh, accessible to people like me. Uh, when I was a child, I did not access the system, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, and how that relates to the work that I've chosen to do today. And then from there, um, I, I had a lot of difficulty trying to uh, be a victim advocate. Um, and by the time I got to law school, I'd had a lot of uh, new ideas uh, and inspirations entered into my life and uh, until ultimately became a public defender, uh, but sort of found my way there through the blessing of being in contact with Sue Ostoff, uh, the National Clearing House for the Defense of Battered Women, um, and uh, really just um, ultimately became a public defender for many years. Uh, and during that time, I found that um, my heart really was torn in that I found that uh, the system was not beneficial really uh, to either of my clients, uh, regardless of whether or not they were um, known to me to be survivors of abuse or not. Uh, or uh, to the survivors uh, of crime, uh, who I was still having contact with, obviously, uh, in some way as a public defender. And um, over the years, I uh, learned more and more about restorative justice and ultimately left the practice of law uh, to practice restorative justice. Um, a little bit about my work in restorative justice. So while it had always been my desire and my intention, having come into this work uh, primarily through, I guess, what we used to call the battered women's movement uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s, um, and, um, and through rape crisis work as well that I'd done over the years, um, I, uh, I didn't believe that restorative justice, I could really get my start in restorative justice or that, that the world was open to restorative justice for those harms that I was most invested in being involved in. And so, uh, what I did was that I, um, I, I, another place that my heart was really pulled, and especially as a new mother at that time, uh, I was thinking a lot about young people and that the notion that we uh, incarcerate young people 
uh, for harm uh, felt unimaginably harmful to me. And so uh, to that end, I um, helped start a youth diversion program in Alameda County. And over the years, um, as, that, as that started to take off, you know, I was working actually at that time pretty closely with uh, the, uh, the criminal legal system, the youth justice system um, uh, in Alameda County. Um, I found that, um, uh, you know, what we were trying to do was just really hard to get off the ground in the beginning. Uh, but after several years of really uh, sticking with it, we started a long-standing youth diversion program here in the Bay Area. Um, and we've found some really amazing, and, and well, we started with uh, a wide variety of harms that young people cause. Uh, some of those included uh, teen dating violence. And those cases really spoke to my heart and in some ways seemed like the most effective cases to work on. Uh, overall, um, the data was really impressive and we've kept track over the course of the years. And we have shown a survivor satisfaction rate of 91% uh, with uh, youth recidivism, uh, you know, just a 44% reduction in Alameda County. In San Francisco, uh, a program that started a few years after that, uh, they did a randomized control trial, and uh, in that process, we saw a massive reduction in, um, so the district attorney would make the decision to charge the crime, um, and then would randomize, instead of charging the youth that were randomized into restorative justice, uh, showed a 13% recidivism rate, one three. Uh, and so this is system circumvention in a sense, like they, they don't even get a public defender, they don't enter, they never enter the courthouse doors. Um, and so that has been uh, really a 13% recidivism rate as compared to the youth who were just charged with a crime had a 53% recidivism rate. So that was pretty astounding to us, uh, really wonderful data. Um, along the way, um, and so, so so that was work I was doing at an organization called Impact Justice. Uh, Impact Justice runs the Restorative Justice Project, which is working with seven jurisdictions across the nation, um, really just doing incredible work. Uh, I recently left my position as the director of the Restorative Justice Project, having built an incredible um, uh, you know, team of people with a woman named Ashley George, uh, who is now heading that work there. And so for folks who are interested in youth diversion work more broadly, I would strongly suggest uh, thinking about partnering with Impact Justice. Um, it's really wonderful what they do. And, 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 the, and the general theme of that work is very similar to what I do today in the context of intimate partner and sexual violence. So it's not about making a bunch of McDonald's in a sense, or like franchising restorative justice across the nation, but rather working closely with um, or pre-existing organizations that have certain skill sets uh, that are uh, really, um, that have a lot of uh, congruency with what it is that's needed in order to roll out a restorative justice um, approach or project or program. Um, and so that's uh, what Impact Justice does. Uh, and it's what I choose to do now, which is to partner with pre-existing organizations. This seems really important in the context of intimate partner and sexual violence. Uh, there is so much uh, that I still utilize to this day uh, from my time uh, as a victim advocate and as, a, uh, as someone working uh, with shelters, with rape crisis. Um, you don't wanna throw out the baby with the bathwater when you're finding that maybe the system isn't being as responsive to survivors as you might um, want it to be today, right? Or that it isn't or isn't, or maybe hasn't ever met the needs of um, survivors. And so uh, the power and control wheel, cycles of violence, all of these things are things that uh, are important for restorative justice facilitators, not just to have learned in a 40 hour training and then go do RJ with your 40 hour training, but rather I feel uh, pretty strongly that particularly when we're talking about face-to-face -face dialogue, um, that, that a real deep awareness through experiential work um, is really critical to the success of applying restorative justice to intimate partner violence. And so um, I'm working with about 12 organizations right now in the Bay Area. Um, and, um, and, and I would say a good half of them are ones that either are working with people 
who have a you know track record of working with people who are survivors or people who have caused harm um, and um, bringing all that wisdom together to uh, think about how might we safely and effectively uh, practice restorative justice uh, with past and ongoing intimate partner violence has been an incredible blessing. But before I get a little bit more into that, I'll just, um, you know, a little bit of how I decided to make this shift, I think, um, and, and what helped us move in this direction in a, a cautious uh, way. And, and that's hard, um, cautious and, and, and sort of thinking about the long view, like how do we set this up in a way that's going to be beneficial in the long run, uh, is something that's really challenging when there's this incredible urgency. Uh, there's this um, sense of, you know, right now harm is happening. And when I think about it from my own childhood perspective, right, like I never contacted the system, I never told any adults what was happening, neither did my, neither did anyone really, um, uh, uh, to the degree to which my mother knew that something was happening, which is pretty unclear. Um, and even with her own struggles, like asking for help as, uh, you know, an immigrant family in rural Pennsylvania, um, was just a non-option, right? I did not want to be separated from my family. I did not want my father to be locked up. I did not want uh, potential immigration consequences uh, for my mother and my sister. And so um, I, I often say that the very systems that in theory were designed to protect me were what ensured my silence, right? And we know this to be true, right? Over 50% of survivors don't uh, contact the system at all, you know, and of those who do, uh, a good 20% say it made them less safe to do so. Uh, so this is, this is very powerful information and what led me to want to uh, build a program that could have been beneficial to me as a child. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I think also um, there were some moments in my life when I was working, at one point I was working with NYPD helping to institutionalize the mandatory arrest policies and we started to keep track of the data. And what I learned uh, was that uh, the mandatory arrest policies were playing out in a way that were causing the, the greatest uptick in arrests was actually of African American women. And I thought this is exactly perverse to what it is that we want to be doing. So for all of these reasons, you know, I, I really started to um, think more deeply about what it is that we could be doing. And so I started with survivor circles, actually, and sitting in circle with survivors, initially of child sexual abuse, um, of women of South Asian descent uh, is how we started. And then, you know, I've spent more and more time having direct dialogues with survivors of um, different forms of intimate partner and sexual violence to ask them questions about what would a restorative justice uh, approach to the, the difficulties you've had in your life, the harms you've experienced look like? How could it be safe for you? How would it meet your needs? Um, in a sense, they were sort of focus groups using circle process itself as a way of doing focus groups. Did the same thing inside prisons. Um, you know, I think our greatest fear is, you know, uh, lethality. And so what does it look like to sit with people in prison who um, feel deep remorse and regret for having killed uh, their wife, their girlfriend, the mother of their children, um, their partner, um, and have deep dialogue with them about, hey, we're thinking about this program. Um, and what I learned from each and every one of them was that they grew up with intimate partner violence in their homes. And the conversations often moved to uh, from, from how could this have been an intervention in your ongoing DV with your partner uh, towards a deeper conversation about what would the impact of something like this have been had it been accessible to you when you were a child growing up with DV. So that was a very powerful um, part of the process and learning how could we do this in a good way. And so uh, the work has really uh, been incredibly blessed by um, the wisdom and knowledge of Gail uh, Buford and Joan Pinnell and Mimi Kim, who I work with very closely on this project. Um, and basically what we do is we go through a series of, we went through a series of trainings on circle process uh, a little bit of knowledge um, that I've brought in from conferencing. Um, we do less conferencing, but a lot of the prep work 
that I've learned through conferencing. Um, I've, I've pulled into the trainings. Um, and then, um, so this organization would like, um, this set of organizations, each of them are, um, you know, skilled in different ways and they're taking on active cases. It's primarily, it's, I think it's entirely survivor initiated at this point where survivors um, are reaching out for help to these various organizations. Some of them are culturally specific organizations. Some of them are um, specific to the LGBTQI community. Some of them um, are, you know, running uh, batters intervention programs with formerly incarcerated people, regardless of how it is that they've come into this group. Uh, survivors are often reaching out saying, you know, I, I don't want to call the police. I want something else instead. And uh, we use co-facilitators. And in that co-facilitator model, um, the preparatory work starts with survivors, where we really just go through the basics of the restorative justice questions that Howard Zayer kind of laid out, right? Who was harmed and what do they need, right? And then whose obligation is it to meet those needs? And then how do we start to imagine what operationalizing getting those needs met look like? Um, and so, um, and then from there, you know, a lot of people are cohabitating with the person who has caused harm. A lot of people are, um, are already in dialogue with the person who's causing them harm uh, to uh, have them uh, be in a conversation with that person. Or sometimes what it is, is they don't want to talk directly with the person who caused them harm in the past, but that there are other broader family dynamics that sort of co-sign abuse um, and that the circle actually needs to happen with a group of women in the family who need to um, understand how they can better support the survivor. Or uh, So it really is driven entirely by the wisdom and knowledge of survivors about what is needed next uh, in order to uh, move forward in a good way is the language we use, right? And so in some ways, this is a harm reduction model, right? And that setting the standard of um, if setting the standard of no one is ever allowed to hurt you ever and leaving is the only way to make that happen and orders of protection and shelters will stop the violence moving forward. If that had been an effective model, we wouldn't be where we are today, but we know that that is not the case, right? And so, um, and so, so we are, you know, cautiously uh, stepping forward and then so there's, we've learned how to prep the person who's causing the harm, helping them understand uh, their behavior, uh, understanding who it is, who else it needs. So the biggest concern I think with uh, restorative justice and the initial fear of restorative justice being used uh, in the context of intimate partner violence was that we were gonna be reprivatizing uh, these forms of harm, right? That there was, there was a private family matter is what we used to say in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And now we're gonna, um, you, we want to uh, really um, bring it out into the open and make an assault that happens in your home a regular old assault, just like any other assault that deserves the same level of accountability, right? Um, and so, but what, what that did, though, was that it actually drove things further into the shadows in some ways, right? Especially for some of us. So, um, so what's really important in restorative processes to prevent that is to spend a lot of that preparatory time figuring out who else needs to be in the circle in order to increase safety, right? And so who wants to see this couple be violence-free? Who is someone who, um, who is someone who has uh, the ear of the person who's causing harm and is respected by that person uh, such that they can come and help them show up as their best self? Uh, who will be monitoring how this family is doing from within their own family and community, right? Rather than professionalizing this, uh, we actually uh, return the power in, in many ways to those who actually are most influential, right? Which is uh, the people who are closest to you, who are the neighbors. Um, you know, growing up in rural Pennsylvania, one of the upsides was that I learned that being a good neighbor meant not minding your own business, right? And so how is it, well, what does it mean that it's our business, right? Um, that we are all connected uh, and that we really believe in people's capacity uh, to stop doing harm. Um, and so, and how do we resource them to do that? So significant prep on both sides, 
uh, when everyone is ready, sides, um, you know, and if there are sides, right, or if it's just, a, if it's a dialogue where we're moving closer and closer to uh, coming up with some um, plans. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes there might be a four-part plan uh, to doing right by the person you've harmed and your family and your community and doing right by yourself. Um, and how is that plan resourced, again, by those in your life? Who's checking in on you to make sure that you're keeping up with that plan? Uh, safety planning can be folded into this. It's quite a radical notion to say, um, you know, um, but effective maybe to say the person who's causing the harm, who says they do not want to cause harm, might actually be someone that you want to involve. This is not the kind of secret safety plan, where do they go, but a different kind of notion of safety planning, uh, which is about um, how do we help keep this family safe. So those are some of the things that we do um, prepare for and uh, bring everyone together ultimately to have a dialogue. Um, and, you know, at least two or three sessions of that, I think, is um, necessary in, with intimate partner violence, whereas with a burglary among strangers, one and done is usually the way restorative justice goes. Uh, ultimately, we'd really love to see families really understand how to do circle themselves. Uh, in my family, um, I feel very blessed that we have not experienced violence uh, in, my, uh, in, my, in my nuclear family. Um, and we use circle all the time in our family. Circle is a pretty regular thing. When I am in conflict with my child, when I am in conflict with my spouse, uh, and, and actually when we're just celebrating, um, you know, things as well, when circle becomes a part of your life, uh, then, you know, it's sort of like this constant de-escalation of what conflict could come up along the way that could then escalate into violence. So um, I'll stop there. I feel like I've probably pushed uh, up against the limit and I wanna make sure that I leave time for Chris and, and for questions. Um, I know that was a very high level overview, but uh, hopefully that, that gave some sense. And um, really just wanna say in closing on this, that we are at a very nascent stage in this process. Um, we are optimistic. We are extremely thoughtful about how it is that we move forward. Um, we don't move forward on every case. Uh, and, um, and in part, that is because we are not resourced to do so. Uh, and, but I do have a fundamental belief that this is a very good way of addressing uh, these kinds of harms uh, and, that, um, and that ultimately they would lead to um, safety at a much more profound level than anything that coercion could ever produce. So I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I thought that was great and we'll definitely dig into some details in a little bit, but um, I'd also like to turn it, the same question over to you, Chris. Thanks, Aparna. Um, thanks, Sujatha. That's something else to follow Sujatha Balaga. Uh, I appreciate being here. Um, my name is Chris Godsey. Uh, I'm in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, uh, which is also known as Onaga Minsing, or the place of the little portage uh, in Ojibwe Mo, in the Ojibwe language. This is land that was ceded uh, by Ojibwe folks in 1854 in a treaty that um, has had a, a checkered past, like a lot of other uh, treaties in the history of what's now the United States is, uh, has have been. Um, this is a, still a very important spiritual and cultural place for Ojibwe folks. Um, it was a stopping place in their migration from the east coast of Turtle Island, or what is now called uh, North America. And it's, um, it's a privilege that, to me that a, a lot of how I've come up in this work is being in contact with and community with Ojibwe folks and other indigenous folks. Um, I co-coordinate the Domestic Violence Restorative Circles program at a nonprofit organization called Men as Peacemakers. Uh, I've done that work since July of 2019. Uh, so I'm very new in this work. It's the first uh, restorative justice-based professional position I've had. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am and then a little bit about how the program I co-coordinate works, um, what we like about how it works, what we wish were different um, and what we're constantly trying to make better. Um, if the work uh, Parna, I'm sorry, Sujatha is involved in is uh, nascent, um, 
I don't know what is newer than nascent, but that's where we are. Uh, we are we're trying really hard uh, to do the best we can, and we're super excited and um, having constant conversations about how we can do things uh, better. And uh, as part of my description of the program, I'll tell you who I'm referring to when I say we, because uh, it's definitely not just me. Um, so my pronouns are, I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm a white guy that grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I was raised in a Christian household. I played football. I went to white schools, grew up in white towns, Huntington, Indiana, uh, and Rochester, Minnesota. I've lived in Duluth since 1989. I came up here for college and have tried to leave a couple times, and it just hasn't taken. Uh, for a little over 20 years, I taught first-year composition and advanced writing, upper division writing classes at both the University of Minnesota Duluth, which is a mid-sized state university here in Duluth, and the College of St. Scholastica, which is a small private Catholic college. Um, I attended the University of Minnesota Duluth. I was on the football team for a couple of years there. And I never say I played football because I didn't play. I practiced a lot. Uh, about 10 years into my teaching career, I had an epiphany that I wish had come a lot sooner. Uh, I was on campus at St. Scholastica. It was during uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I, I really stopped to look at one of the posters promoting some events and realized that um, it looked like a lot of posters I had seen in similar situations since I had started college in 1989. This was in the early 2000s when I was having this experience. Uh, and all the concepts and events named on the poster were uh, teaching women and girls how to avoid being assaulted and what to do if they got assaulted. Uh, and for the first time ever, I had a, a visceral reaction to that in terms of it just not being the not being the way to approach that. Um, I, I hadn't, uh, I'd listened to a bunch of Ani DeFranco songs, basically. I hadn't ever studied uh, the problem. I had, uh, of course, I had known women who had survived men's violence. I had known men who used violence against women, but I'd never really stopped to analyze it. And I did that in that moment, or something made me do it. And I, uh, I fired off an email to the director of uh, student health services at the school, and I said, why is this always the approach? Why is no one ever uh, talking to boys and men about how not to assault or why not to assault? And he said, uh, you should go to this talk tomorrow night. This guy named Jackson Katz is coming to campus. And I'd never heard of Jackson. Uh, and I went to see him and my mind was blown. And I read his book and that started me on the process that led me to where I am now. I, I immediately became a member of a couple committees uh, devoted to um, reforming the campus on climate. So it, it was less welcoming to the social and cultural norms that uh, justify boys and men being taken more seriously than girls and women. Uh, that led me to uh, working with a guy who was working at the local women and children's shelter here. He was co-facilitating battering intervention at the domestic abuse and intervention programs office on Superior Street here in Duluth. And I trained to do that work um, and I started doing that in 2010, and I still do it. I took a, a year's break. Um, I, I, have, I have great regard for um, the folks at DAIP, the folks who manage what's called the, the Duluth model. Uh, I am, I'm also clear-eyed about some of the problematic aspects of uh, the way some coordinated community responses are implemented. Um, the effects of mandatory arrests on certain communities. Um, my experience of um, discussing the Duluth model and DIP is that it, it sometimes is unintentionally misunderstood. Um, and I won't go into a real long conversation, but um, it's a, it has been an important, the, the battering intervention work, um, the way it is put forth in the coordinating a process of change for men who batter curriculum has been um, important in changing my life uh, and it changed the way I was a classroom teacher and it changes the way I'm a, I'm a human being. Um, and I, I chalk a lot of that up to Paulo Freire's version of critical dialogue, um, problem posing questions. I, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about um, the human beings 
uh, that I spent a lot of time with who have used violence against fellow human beings. And it's just helped me be a, a lot more curious about a lot of things. Um, I don't, I still don't practice a version of restorative justice that's as uh, quote unquote pure as uh, what some people do. Um, but I, I also see deep restorative aspects in critical dialogue among men who have been arrested for using violence against women. So I did, um, I, I did that uh, battering intervention work while being a full-time teacher for a long time. I finally got to the point where um, after my doctorate, I, did, I have a, an EDD in teaching and learning. I um, finished that in 2017. My dissertation was about um, habits of mind that are similar among men within patriarchy, white people within white supremacy, and teachers within a system I called uh, teacher preeminence. Uh, systems that are that teach some people that they are more important than others and, and give them um, kind of free reign to exercise that dominance at will and expect other people's compliance. Um, by that time, I was far more interested in doing nonviolence work than I was in teaching semicolons in five paragraph essays. Um, so I started trying to find something else to do and I wound up at, at Menace Peacemakers. Um, I had never done restorative justice work before. Um, and like I said a, a minute or so ago, I'm still not convinced, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm doing it, um, but I, I value it and, uh, and I'm trying to do more of it all the time. So uh, it's a, a relatively brief description of my kind of personal transformation. I, sh I should also say that part of that, um, part of that process for me has been learning a lot about myself. Uh, I started my co-facilitation work in battering intervention, believing that I was, um, it was going to be a real privilege for the men in the groups to have me help them learn some things because I had never been violent um, and I was going to be able to help, help them see some things. Uh, and I'm definitely taking a shot at myself when I say that because 15 minutes into the first uh, group I observed, I realized that I had some things to learn about myself uh, and that I had been a, a much more violent person than I realized. Um, that's, a, that's a big deal to me because I, I don't believe it's possible to really help people do transformative work without experiencing transformative experiences um, that are difficult. We're asking people to do really, really hard things. Um, and I have not experienced what a lot of the guys I work with have experienced, um, but they also haven't experienced what I have and we learn a lot from each other. Uh, and I, I take that work directly into the, the domestic violence restorative circles work I do. So um, that's what I'll refer to as the DVRC. That's one of multiple programs that Menace Peacemakers runs. Uh, Menace Peacemakers is a, it's a multi-program, small agency. Uh, it's, mostly a primary prevention, primary violence prevention program or uh, agency. Um, the DVRC is one of a couple programs that works with people after they have survived or used violence. Uh, but other programs are in schools and working with kids and um, trying really hard to, to prevent gender-based violence. Uh, the DVRC, the Domestic Violence Restorative Circle, Circles, came about in roughly 2011. And it was um, at the end of about four or five years of sometimes really fractious, contentious conversations among various stakeholders in Duluth's coordinated community response, who are trying to figure out what to do about the roughly 30% of men who had been through battering intervention and kept reoffending. They kept showing back up in the county jail. They kept showing back up at the work farm. They had been through DIP two or three or four or five times. Uh, and I, I honestly don't know who it was who first suggested some version of restorative justice, but they did. And there were some folks who were immediately uh, really excited about it. There were some folks, my understanding is that they were mostly uh, advocates for women who had survived violence, who were, to say they were reluctant uh, is a good Minnesota understatement. They were reluctant. Um, but what happened is that there was a, a committee formed. Uh, it included uh, a district judge, Minnesota, or Duluth is in Minnesota's sixth judicial district, the sixth judicial district judge. Uh, there were prosecutors, defense attorneys, advocates, folks who work for DIP, um, representatives from uh, the shelter, 
uh, and, and some other places. And for four or five years, they got together and talked about what a restorative justice-based program might look like. And the end result was what was initially a pre-sentencing program. So there would be, it was, it's a circle-based program. It, it has a lot of the same components of um, a, what you can read in circle descriptions uh, in terms of uh, the way it functions and the intentions and the, the solemnity with which people uh, uh, hold the process when they're involved in it. A couple of years later, this is still before I got there, it became a um, transition program for people coming out of incarceration. Um, my understanding is that was largely because of a change in grant funding. The, the focus of the grant changed, so the focus of the program changed. So that's still where we are. Uh, the DVRC technically has two programs. One is the Transition Circles program, which is for folks who have, are coming out of incarceration or who have recently been incarcerated for using violence in relationships. The other program is a survivor program, also a circle-based program. And they function a lot, a lot differently. Um, one of the results of how the program came about is that we are very, very, very closely aligned with the state. Um, our steering committee still includes the same sixth judicial district judge, includes a county prosecuting attorney. We're in St. Louis County, Minnesota. It includes uh, folks from legal aid and defense attorneys, um, folks who have the, the Duluth Coordinated Community Response Coordinator, a guy named Scott Miller, who works at DEIP, um, and uh, the, uh, folks from Corrections, a few other folks uh, who are involved in cases. Uh, technically, we are set up that we would accept referrals from and gladly work with anyone who has used violence against anyone else, regardless of orientation or expression or, or any other characteristic uh, at the moment. All our participants are cis hetero men who have used violence in monogamous relationships against cis hetero women. Um, that probably deserves a much longer conversation uh, to where we are right now. Um, I co coordinate the program. I'm technically the program director. My direct colleague is a woman named Ashley Cohn, and she coordinates the, um, the actual circle processes and maintains our um, relationships with volunteers. We have a uh, about 157 folks in our volunteer uh, database right now. And I don't think nearly that many would be prepared to jump into a circle tomorrow, but a, a pretty good chunk of them would be. Um, so she and I work, uh, we have a, there's a liaison in the St. Louis County Probation Office um, whose entire caseload is people who have been arrested for using domestic violence and sentenced, you know, pled to something um, and he is like the third member of our team. We're not part of probation. He doesn't work for us, but we are very, very um, consistently working together. So we get referrals from within the system most often from uh, defense attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, uh, occasionally from uh, social workers and case workers. And um, our first move is to see if they meet the basic qualifications for um, being a credible program candidate. Uh, we don't take first timers. Uh, the program was set up to work with people who have relatively long histories of domestic violence. Um, there's not uh, any written precise description of here's what long history means. Um, it's gotta be more than one or two charges and they have, some of them have to be relatively recent. Um, we have accepted people into the program whose most recent charge isn't a DV charge. Um, but who uh, a, a probation officer or defense attorney says this is something that he knows he needs to work on and it's part of uh, it's been part of his personal and criminal history. So we get a referral. Uh, we decide whether or not we're going to have a screening conversation with the candidate and the screening conversations are among Ashley, uh, Steve, the probation officer and me. Um, we're constantly tinkering with those uh, to help to help them be as credible and as effective as possible. Um, a lot of the, I'm gonna say guys, I'm gonna use male pronouns because it's all guys in our program right now. Um, a lot of the guys who we are screening know that um, if they get accepted into the program, that's gonna mean a downward dispositional departure. They're not gonna to go to prison. They're gonna face uh, something that feels a lot less arduous to them than what, what the sentencing guidelines in Minnesota um, 
could be the result for them. Um, so they, um, they know how to perform. They're really system savvy guys. Um, we're very often working with indigenous men and men of color, uh, and black men. I'm white, Ashley's white, Steve's white. We represent the state, we represent authority. Uh, Steve, Ashley and I are very conscious of that all the time. And in some ways we feel at a loss. Um, we recognize that as a, as a challenge and possibly a weakness in the program. Um, if we all three decide that this person has the, the capacity and a, a glimmer of willingness to engage in what the program asks, we accept them into the program. And what that means they're being accepted into is um, a one, once a week, two hour conversation with a small circle of community volunteers uh, that goes through four stages. We usually expect it to take seven to eight months. Uh, and those stages start off with very light getting to know you conversation. Uh, the volunteers who have been trained uh, in some uh, domestic, domestic violence basics and nuances, trained in, uh, in dialogue, trained in the circle process. Um, those folks and the participant, we refer to them all as circle members. The first month or so of the circle process is them all getting to know each other. Um, the, the conversations become a little bit more deep in the next few months. Uh, the third stage of the circle, if it's happening, uh, functioning the way it's meant to function, is that um, after having built a base of some camaraderie, some community, some trust with each other, uh, they start talking directly about violence that the, the participant has used. And the last part of the circle is intended to, um, to do something productive with those conversations about violence and talk about um, what repair what harm can be repaired, how it can be repaired, how people can see um, changes are being made. One of the, the aspects of our process that is much different from how we wish it would be is that almost all of our contact is with people who have used violence. Um, we offer a survivor circle to the people who have most recently experienced violence used by everyone we accept as a participant. Uh, we rarely, um, have that offer accepted. It's not a one-shot deal. We're very careful to say, um, you can respond to us anytime. Here's what, here's what the offer is. You can drive the process. We'll be whatever you need. We have access to other programs and other folks around town. Um, most often what we get is very, very polite um, regrets. Folks would just say, I, I don't want any part of this. Um, I'm tired of it. Please just help him. Um, it's one of the ways in which our process deviates most from what I would see an ideal restorative process being. Um, Sujatha described a process that's driven by, and a lot of other people have described processes driven by um, survivor needs and survivor desires. Um, we are, instead of operating based on what a survivor says they need and want, we're very op often operating on um, what a person who has caused harm believes would make it right. Um, and that's, we try to do that the best we can. We're, you know, we're trying to help everybody, um, but we are constantly racking our brains to try to figure out how to make the, the process more inclusive. We, uh, one of the results of how the program came about is that we right now aren't in a place where we would consider putting uh, people who have used and survived violence in the same room together. We are closer than ever to having those conversations. Um, we don't think it's bad or wrong, um, but there are people at whose pleasure we serve who would need a lot of convincing for us to be able to do that. Um, and I don't say that in a shady way or in a bad way. There are people I admire and um, I'm grateful to be doing the work we're doing, but it's um, especially after learning about some other programs, including um, one that's, um, Todd Augusta Scott is involved in in Halifax, Nova Scotia, who will be um, part of this series next week, I believe. Um, I'm really interested in, in learning more. Um, ideally, I'm uh, sorry. Sorry, can I ask you to wrap up? Yeah, Keep yes, mm -hmm. please do. Um, ideally, the way the process ends is that um, uh, the, the participant um, writes uh, commitments to um, nonviolence become part of 
their probation conditions. Mm -hmm. um, they um, usually are on probation for at least another two years after they're done with the program. Um, so that's part of how the probation officer works with them. It's uh, the, the judge who sees them for 60 day review hearings throughout the rest of their probation is also conscious of those. Uh, thanks for stopping me. I would have just kept right on going. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Um, I see some of the que some questions starting to come in. So please post questions if you have them. Um, before we get to those, I do want to ask a couple of follow up questions. First of all, thank you both for such uh, rich inputs. Uh, there's, I think, a, quite a lot to unpack and discuss. Um, both of you talked about who you include right in these circles and um, you know Chris the Menace Peacemakers program has a set of volunteers um, so Jatha you said that um, you're thinking about who do we need in these circles who's invested in making sure that that this relationship is is not violent and I was wondering if you could both talk a little bit more about this I guess from Chris um, from your program you know do you look for anything in the volunteers um, and maybe what's the philosophy behind that uh, likewise Sujatha I'm wondering if um, if you've ever struggled with certain circle members or you know choosing who belongs in a circle um, and I'll just add one comment to this. Last week, we briefly touched on the fact that sometimes communities perpetuate harmful norms and actions. And this is certainly true in the case of intimate partner violence. Uh, so, you know, how do you, uh, I guess, how do you react to that when you come up against that in your work? I guess I'll, I'll go with Sajatha first. Okay. Um, so uh, in terms of the circles uh, themselves, like who is in it, we don't, we don't choose. So it's really important um, in this uh, approach that we're taking to not be deciders. Uh, the circle keepers really in this process is the real thing is like to hand the power back over to families and communities to learn how to be their, their best selves. Right, um, but we do really center the wisdom of the survivor and the person who's caused harm um, and helping them figure out who are their people that are gonna help them be their best selves and help de-escalate de the violence, right? And there's two tools that we use uh, in working with those people. One is pod mapping that comes, you know, from uh, the amazing work of Mia Mingus and the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. Uh, love that tool. Um, the other one we use is one that is more of a standard social work tool that's been used in family group conferencing and other approaches with those three concentric circles where like who knows what's going on that's really close to you and then who's a, who are the people like in the next layer out of your life and then the furthest out people that you wouldn't really think to engage in a process like this but then like how do we help people X their own people out that are like who co-signs the violence or who eggs you on to you know be not your best self or who you know um i love the question of like who's got your back no matter what even when you're wrong and then getting them to realize that's really somebody that shouldn't come to the circle right and so so we use those two tools together uh to help people identify their own people um, and then in those preparatory meetings we meet with all those people and then ideally we're meeting with the person who's caused harm and their supporters together once and sometimes there's a circle before the circle right um and a lot of stuff might be going on in that where there's a lot of people who need to say to this person before we get in the circle we've been telling you to get out of this relationship for 10 years or or you know you actually have a drinking problem that is a part of this whole mess or whatever it is right so those circles can help sort of um address some of the things that will prevent people from being as, as, as um, cohesive in the collective conversation. Um, and so that's, that's, those are the two tools that we primarily use and really wanna just reiterate, not the decider. Like I love, love that aspect of, of practicing as a restorative justice practitioner uh, in this context, not the decider. Yeah, I don't, I don't like being a decider and I am, I wind up being one. Um, our survivor circles, I'll talk about those first um, because there's 
uh, unfortunately at this point less to say about them. Those are, as I said before, the survivor driven. So Ashley, our volunteer and circles coordinator um, from her uh, database of volunteers has some who have specifically expressed interest in, in working only or mostly with survivors. Um, she will try to put together um, a group of people that fits with what she knows about the survivor after some conversations. The survivor also is invited to, to bring in anyone else that they would like to be there. And then the whole process is, is driven as much as we wish the rest of the process were by the survivor needs. Um, I've been um, an unexpected part of uh, the support conversations with the survivor who just needed some place to sit. We have comfortable couches in our place close to her apartment and she needed, she just wanted to come talk to somebody. Um, there have also been um, processes that are a lot about accessing services, um, negotiating processes, um, figuring out stuff like that. Uh, the way we put together volunteer circles and transition circles uh, for the mostly men who have used violence is similar. Um, but before Ashley um, starts deciding which volunteers might fit in this person's circle, um, we train them. It's not nearly as an ex extensive training in the, as I would like it to be, um, but it does help us see um, who, who might have perspectives that aren't conducive to the process we're attempting to uh, engage people in. Um, most often in my experience, that's not necessarily people who are gonna do a lot of colluding with a participant or who are going to, to um, perpetuate some of the thinking that, that has led the person to see violence as an option. Um, it's more often folks who, whether they realize it or not, are there because they kinda wanna stick it to a guy who's, who's used violence. Um, and that's, that's not to say that they're, they're mean or clueless or anything other than folks who are, who are dealing with some feelings about that, that they didn't realize until they got to the situation where they're, they're kind of steeping themselves in it. Um, so we have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as part of our training team, we have folks who have, are survivors and have worked as advocates. And uh, it's very often survivors who are as part of their healing process or part of their resolution process are really wanting to be part of this work and just aren't as ready for it as they might want to be. Um, and some of those folks have come back after they, they proceed through more of their process. Um, but some of them just say, yeah, I, I thought I could do this and I just, I can't, I can't do it. Um, I would say 85% of the folks that come through our training wind up in circles. And the way Ashley tries to apportion them is, is based on what she knows about uh, the participant. She tries to, um, in the four or five or six folks that are volunteers, she tries to um, balance folks who share that person's background and perspective and differ from it in productive ways. Uh, and we always offer the opportunity for for participants to bring in support people. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the guys we work with are incredibly socially isolated um, and a lot of them don't have supportive folks in their lives. So that happens every now and then, but not, not super often. Thank you. Um, backtracking a little bit, both of you largely work, it looks like in circles when you're working, um, when you're, Chris, I guess you're working in circles all the time. Um, but Sajatha, you've been mentioning circles a lot uh, when responding to intimate partner violence. So can you talk a little bit about why circles over conferencing? Or are there times when you would choose conferencing over circles? I generally let the model be survivor driven. We haven't had time yet to train fully in conferencing for this particular project, but in the past, I've always just let survivors. Um, I'm working on a case right now where I describe both models to the survivor and I, um, and I also talk sometimes with a person who's caused the harm and ask them, you know, what their willingness is. The conferencing in some ways puts the person who's harmed in a very particular hot seat right? Like the order of speaking is like, you did something wrong and then we're going to attend to that, right? Versus circle where it's like more of a circle and people are allowing the story to come out. And I particularly think that in um, 
I work a bit um, in um, the queer community where there's um, allegations of mutual harm, which may or may not be true. And then, you know, so sometimes circle can really be a way where all the parts of the story can come out a little bit more clearly. Um, when things are really messy, I feel like circle is better. Uh, when things are really clear and somebody's really willing to be in that hot seat, uh, then um, conferencing, I think, is the better model. But generally speaking, uh, allow the survivor to sort of lead. And I've just had survivors say, sounds like circles. That I, like I describe the models and circles as survivors say, uh, I really, I like that talking piece. I like the, I like everybody taking a turn. I like, um, oh, I don't want him to go f first. And, you know, I don't want, you know, whatever it is that they don't like the conferencing doesn't seem to fit with what survivors are feeling. Um, but I, I haven't done a study on survivor preferences. There's no numbers there. It's just a, it's just a gut. Um, one other thing that I just want to clarify really quickly, too, on who gets to be in the circle um, is that it really has to do, too, with who who will, like, what's a deal breaker for people? I've had, I, that's a little bit of the shuttle, I do very, very little shuttle negotiation in this process. I really want all of wisdom to come from everyone coming together um, and to not be hearing anything from me and biased lens, which I have many biases and I've tried to keep them out of the circle by letting people talk directly. Um, but I do clear everyone's presence with everybody. And so that's a part of who ends up deciding, you know, people are like, I won't, I cannot come if her sister is going to be there or, you know, that sort of thing can um, lead to. And then sometimes it's like, then I take that back saying, there's a little issue with your sister being present. And then she'll say, actually, my sister is a real troublemaker, <laughs> probably shouldn't come. Like, I've actually never had any trouble with that. And everyone seems to agree, which is really interesting about who's going to help everybody move in this good direction. So that was just something I really wanted to clarify about who's present. Uh, my understanding of how the domestic violence restorative circles program became a circle based program is that the folks who were involved uh, roughly 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more in organizing it, uh, were heavily influenced by Mark Umbright and Kay Pranis, uh, who were working at the University of Minnesota, um, by uh, folks in the Yukon, whose names I can't remember, folks in Arizona and Nogales, um, and largely by some uh, Ojibwe elders who um, there's a, Reservation south of Duluth, the Fond du Lac, um, a band of Minnesota Chippewa. There are elders there who have been doing circle-based work for a long time. And uh, the white folks, the largely white folks who were involved in putting this program together and getting it started um, were heavily influenced by all those, all those folks. Um, and my, my guess slash understanding is that conferencing was never never really even talked about because the those circle based ideas were were so justifiably um valued and and just part of what they wanted to what they wanted to be uh, i don't know that we would you know, if someone came to us and said would you would you consider learning a new way of going about things and and doing something different i think we'd be willing to have the conversation i don't think we're um, trying to be doctrinaire about anything. We want to we want to help people have safer lives, and um, we'd be willing to have that conversation. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn to a couple of questions that came in. Uh, how do you handle working with persons who harm, who have mental health issues? Example: a person with bipolar disorder that regularly goes off their medications. Um, an individual with a personality disorder that has extreme difficulty with emotional regulations that comes with violence. I guess those are two different examples. You know, just briefly, I would say that it's important to include mental health help in the process to the degree to which that's available to people. Um, and we're really open to having providers in the circle as are desired and needed. Um, and also maybe to, again, using those prep circles as a time with family and community on sort of one quote unquote side to help um, build some management around mental health that the whole conversation may go no further than that and that may help de-escalate things. So um, one of my dear friends is a psychiatrist and we've been having conversations for years where she came to me saying, because in the beginning I was like, I can't deal 
with when I was just doing the kid work. I can't deal with the kids with the serious mental health issues. And I just don't think they, there's a mental health collaborative court and maybe they should go to that instead. <laughs> and, and she said, you really did not get like, that's really ableist and you're really denying kids who could take responsibility, this amazing pre-charged diversion program. And what you need to do is think about how to do it with mental health help being a part um, of the process. And so that really influenced me. Um, in trying to be um, more open to the notion of how do we how do we pull in who's needed, um, and again I try to deprofessionalize the process, but there are certain circumstances under which it seems really necessary to do so. So that's the brief answer. Yeah, um, part of our screening process involves a, a candidate sign a release of information, so we can get some. Um, history of mental health uh, challenges, chemical dependency. Um, if someone is, is managing an existing condition, um, going to meetings, uh, doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, staying on medication, um, we have no problem accepting them into the program if, as participants if they meet the other expectations. Um, we we're not diagnosticians. We, we can't you know, say for sure whether someone is uh, sociopathic or psychopathic, but if, it, if we have trouble carrying a conversation with them during a screening, uh, we don't want to put them or volunteers in the position of trying to make sense of each other. We, we do have a, sort of a middle ground where we will accept someone with conditions and say, uh, so if they're in the St. Louis County Jail, say uh, upon Upon being released from the St. Louis County Jail, um, will start their official circle process after they complete a certain amount of time um, in outpatient chemical dependency treatment or inpatient or something else that helps them manage a, an existing condition in a way that will help them better take advantage of what we're asking them to do. We're also very conscious of how heavily programmed a lot of people were working with R and uh, you know people who are who are living stable lives would have trouble finding the capacity to do what, what a lot of the folks we're working with are trying to do um, so we're willing to do it we try to be very careful about it um, but it's it's uh, it's not inherently problematic for us thank you All right so I think your answers actually lead nicely to this next set of questions um, so I'm going to, they both tie to the criminal justice system. So I'm going to ask one to Sujatha and then one to Chris. So the one to Sujatha is about the juvenile program. Um, you mentioned that there would be a screening process after the decision to charge, but before ever having to go to court. How was that decision made and what involvement do you look to from prosecutors when making those decisions? Is it their decision on what case gets considered for RJ or is it a collaboration? And then to Chris, um, when talking about it as a pre-sentencing program, does the offender, I don't know if you know this, but does the offender enter into guilty pleas to be involved in the RJ process or is the entire case put on hold until after the program? So we will, um, in the youth uh, diversion context, we work with um, where it is m more systems aligned, right? Which is not my DV work at all, right? Which is not systems uh, connected. Um, so with the youth diversion context, uh, we work with DAs who are willing to do uh, two primary things that are quite interesting for DAs to, com to commit to do. One is to have discretionless diversion. So we picked an entire set of cases that are automatically eligible based on um, you know, the severity of the crime, the age of the young person who's caused the harm, the number of priors, whatever it is, the criteria. And then the DA says all of these cases are automatically eligible for restorative justice. Uh, this is critically important because we know that discretion equals discrimination. It is not meant to say, you know, anything other than this is what the data tells us. We don't, um, we, we really just honor DAs acknowledging that doing discretionless diversion on the basis of a predetermined set of criteria will prevent uh, that kind of cherry picking that often happens. Um, so, uh, so that's, yeah, I would just say that. And the other thing that they do is give us a memorandum of understanding that nothing that's said in restorative processes can be used in a court of law if the process breaks down. 
uh, absolutely critical for us to be able to get honest participation from the young people who are involved, both the survivor and the person who's caused harm. And so we get this in writing uh, in advance from any jurisdiction that I'm working directly with. Um, and we have samples of that, rjdtoolkit.org. I'll put that up um, in the chat. Um, and you can see all of our tools and things are there for the youth diversion side of things. Alperna, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Um, when does the offender in your program enter into guilty pleas to be involved in the RJ process, or is the entire case put on hold until after the program? So basically, they want to know where in the process. Yeah. Um, so in in its incarnation as a transition from incarceration process, um, there has to be a a sentence or a plea in, in place and participation in the program becomes part of those conditions and part of a probation contract. Um, I don't know how it functioned when it was a, when it was a, when it was a sentencing circle focus. That was far enough before my time. Uh, I should know. And I, and I just don't. Thank you. Um, so for both of you, what happens if the person who caused harm uh, does perform, so to speak, and gets into the program, but then does not abide by any of the um, program circles framework in repairing harm? So when it's systems aligned, again, the case goes back to the referring entity. Um, and we are very, very careful to not say why. So we have a set of codes like, case returned not amenable for restorative justice. And we don't want to become investigators for the state or the program will not be trusted. Um, and so that's when it's state aligned. When it's not state aligned, right, that is a problem <laughs> with all of these things, right, where the survivor doesn't want to contact the state. So it, we really make it very clear in working with survivors and regardless of whether it's uh, connected to state uh, diversion or not, we want to be really, really sure that expectations are reasonable on the part of survivors and that we cannot compel or force anyone in either system to participate in a way that is, you know, so would you want to do this anyway, even if the person who harmed you doesn't, blah, blah, right, is, you know, like, this is what you want. And would there be some benefit to you to doing this anyway? And if the answer is no, I'm only going to do this if this person is going to necessarily X, Y, and Z, then we really encourage people to reconsider participation, right? Um, because there is no, uh, you know, um, there is no way to coerce people. Uh, you know, we see this from recidivism rates. We see this whether or not it's systems aligned or not. Um, and so that's just something that I think we have to be really, really honest about um, and that we are trying to do better and, and reduce uh, future harm. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about that. Uh, you, whether you know it or not, you tapped into a bunch of emails I was sending and receiving this morning about a specific person we're working with. Um, so the, the, two, the two most common reasons for a DVRC transition circle process to be terminated are um, someone gets locked back up again. They, they re-offend and they um, can't make it to meetings. There has been one case where a a guy got locked up and we were able to coordinate with prosecuting attorney, judge, and corrections to let the guy maintain his process while he was in the county for a short period of time. Uh, the other most common situation is that um, they just stop showing up, uh, which means they're violating probation um, and usually means they're also not checking with their probation officer. Um, and so they abscond and after certain amount of time, we decide to terminate that. The situation I referred to a moment ago, um, the process has been, been going on for about eight months and we have uh, both um, information we can share openly and information we can't that suggest um, the participant is presenting one part of one version of himself to everybody and circle in an official capacity and another version of himself to um, the partner he is still with. Um, and unlike a lot of other people we work with, he, has, he is of means uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, and 
we have suspended his process without terminating it. So, um, and we're very above board about this with him, um, said, here's why, here's what we're seeing, here's what we're not seeing. Um, this is gonna get exhausting for you and everybody else if we prolong it, so let's take a break. Um, we'll stay in contact with you. We're not expecting Circle Volunteers to stay in contact with you. Um, we're very careful that Circle Volunteers know they didn't do something wrong. Everybody's, you know, like uh, Sujatha said, you can't coerce or force um, anyone to do anything. But we also can't say this guy's process is complete. Um, so the process is suspended for a while. Um, he's going to be under uh, increased probation scrutiny, including uh, chemical testing, and we'll see where the process goes in a, in a little while. It's, it is far from ideal. No one's real happy about it. I, I just want to take a really quick step back to um, in answering this, you know, and I, I sort of jump to the logistics. And one of the things that's really, really important for us to understand is why aren't they participating? And if they haven't cut and run, which that does occasionally happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you need in order? Did we touch something? Did we get to something that hurt so bad that there was like a, so who do we need? Who else do we need to pull into the circle to help you hold that pain from your past? Or what else, you know, who would help you do this? Uh, what else can I do to help you uh, be your best self? Um, and then if it's not me, then who else can we enlist to go get, literally go get your cousin? Um, so that's a part of the process too. Thank you. Um, I was gonna save this question for the end, but I actually think that we're leading right into it. Um, it's a brief one, but I, I think it's really important for anyone working in, in this space. Uh, can you please share how you self-care or maybe more broadly talk about the importance of that in this? Because I think it gets skipped over a lot of these conversations. Chris, I keep going first. I hope that's okay. It's, um, it's, it's right behind me, actually. It's my altar back there and my, med my daily meditation practice is the only way I can do this. Um, and um, I also uh, really believe in circle keepers circles. So what are we holding that we get to practice being in circle in a way that I'm not holding circle all the time. My husband is a circle keeper. Um, I have lots of friends in restorative justice. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really wonderful to uh, be able to, to debrief uh, in some ways without sharing uh, confidential information, at least being able to say like, I'm doing a case that involves CSA and I'm a CSA survivor and how is this case landing on me? Um, and then, you know, just really trying to get out in nature. It's been particularly hard of late, right? Especially when we've got both COVID and the fires, right? That make it really, really hard. Um, I've got a call to this afternoon with a, with a, on a DV case um, with, with kids um, and a, a, a teen dating violence situation. And I, you know, it's um, getting, if, if it were not smoky, I would definitely make a point of like the minute I finish a call, I get, I go for a walk around. Um, you know, long hot showers, just really what what works for you, what soothes you know your mind, your body, and your spirit, and just keeping track of those things um, and saying how many of those did I do this week, um, and then I have a group of really wonderful uh, girlfriends that I did a leadership uh, institute with, and we have regular check ins. What is going on with everyone's mental health in the middle of everything that is going on in the world right now? So it's it's like it's a super. I cannot do this work if I am not taking care of my spiritual, physical, and mental health. Like, it's just not gonna, not gonna happen. Uh, yeah, I have a hodgepodge of stuff. Um, I'm 49 years old, and I have a, an ongoing text message with a bunch of other 49-year-old white dudes that I went to college with, uh, and it is not about anything serious, and sometimes that helps. Um, I'm blessed to live in a place with a lot of lakes and a lot of really good mountain biking trails. So I get out and I get my heart rate up and I breathe in fresh air and kind of exhaust myself into um, numbness sometimes. Um, I'm, my wife, whose name is Shannon, um, is always willing to listen to anything I have to share. And uh, the folks I work directly with and I are good about staying in contact with each other. Um, and then on some nights, it's just about uh, binging ER on Hulu. Um, 
and, and enjoying uh, some bourbon in moderation. Thank you. I know I'm just a moderator, but I'll also add one thing. Um, I think it's very important to set boundaries and understand uh, how much you can do, especially in this space. Uh, I know for me, I had to set some boundaries about the number of immigrant experience and anti-racism conversations I could have with people who seem to be learning uh, <laughs> about those issues for the first time right now. And I find them you know, very draining and burdensome um, at such a trying time. So I've you know, learned to walk away from those or say like, here are some other outlets for you. You know, this is an important conversation, but it's not something I can be part of. Um, and those are circles also that I just can't participate in as well. Can I, I add one thing? This, it might sound strange in the context of self-care, but um, it's, it's very important for me when I get frustrated, when I feel frustrated with other people, or I feel overwhelmed to remember that for me, um, a big part of why I do this work and have this job is part of my restorative process, part of my amends making process. Um, and if I remember that, um, I don't know if that qualifies as self-care, but it, it helps me sometimes when I feel heavy and stuck to remember that I'm, I didn't find my way here accidentally. I've got some intentions. Thank you. Um, turning to another question, can you both talk a bit about how you address power dynamics, manipulation, et cetera, that may have existed in the relationship to avoid that being replicated in circles, especially in subtle ways that perhaps only the involved parties would pick up on? Chris, do you mind taking that one first? Um, we do. Yeah, so we're, um, that is one of the reasons that uh, the program I co-coordinate does not put survivors and people who abuse violence in the same circle. There were, there were enough folks in town who were part of the process of establishing the, the program that said, we're, we're not gonna be behind it if, if you do that. Um, that was a while ago. I've talked to some of those folks since then. Um, I am at, experience tells me some of them are still there um, within the building. I think we are closer than we've ever been to thinking about possibly maybe considering talking about that. Um, the way we help folks who have used violence um, start to build some self-awareness and consciousness about power issues or control issues are some of the same ways we do it in battering intervention programs. We use the power and control wheel. We use the equality wheel. Um, we use some vignettes that are part of the DIP coordinating a process, coordinating a process of change curriculum. Uh, and one of, the, one of the benefits of having people of multiple perspectives in a circle is that just a lot of perspectives can be shared. A lot of people can come from a lot of different places and saying, here's a thing I didn't see about myself until someone helped me, or here's a thing I experienced, or um, you know, there can be some powerful dialogue. Um, sometimes that can drift into trying to convince a person. Uh, I, I would never do that, but I know other people who do sometimes. No, I'm, I do that uh, sometimes. It's, it's easy to, to find yourself there, especially if the, the person I referred to a few minutes ago whose circle is suspended um, has, has, based on things he has directly said in circle, has been remarkably financially abusive and doesn't see it. Uh, we can explain to him, we can say, here's what you said, here's what, you know, here's, here's how all this stuff fits together. Um, and I, I, I truly don't think he's, he's, seeing it and just being defiant, I think he really doesn't see it. Um, it's one of the reasons that process is, is on a break right now. So we can kind of um, you know, reconnoiter and figure out what we need to figure out. Um, but that the process of um, looking at contextual factors, looking at um, power hi hierarchies, dominance hierarchies, uh, expectations of compliance and submission, um, that's all part of the conversation and it's, as you might imagine, it's different for every, every participant and group of people.
Um, just really briefly, I think it's a really important in the uh, work that we're doing. If people want to work directly with a person who's caused them harm, they're usually already in relationship with them and they're having these conversations in which they're living with daily manipulation, living with daily power dynamics, right? And so this isn't, it's really important to know that it's not like we're bringing two people together where they've been, you know, she's been fleeing or the person who's being harmed is fleeing and this person is somewhere else and they're you've know, been threatening to kill them and then we're bringing them together and then it's going to cause the whole thing to escalate right these are people who are still sharing custody uh, see each other multiple times a week uh, cohabitating potentially etc so all the stuff we're worried about happening is happening it's already happening all the time in their relationship um, and so i think that that's really really important to understand uh, that this is an opportunity to try to de-escalate that. And so it really is, again, a power and control wheel is a really important and powerful tool in helping people see things for the first time in those prep sessions. Um, but also who else in the family and community is tired of the BS? Who's going to call the person who's using the harm out in a loving way that's calling them to be their best selves? So again, um, this is about developing deep relationship um, and having the pre-existing deep relationships be what start to call that out. Uh, because I really want to say this, the restorative justice process, people have a story that the talking piece is the great equalizer. I say all the time that it is not. Just because people have an uninterrupted opportunity to speak doesn't mean that the, all the pre-existing power dynamics that exist in that relationship are not in the room. And so the prep work is really critical in terms of helping people see dynamics that they never saw before and bringing in all the humans who can call this person out in a good way calling them out, I hate that expression, it's calling them to their best selves, calling them to who they claim they wanna be um, in a way that where the, that they're gonna to listen to, to these folks. That's what's really critical. Um, but I really do wanna reiterate that all of the things we're afraid of are happening when we're not there. They're happening not in the courtroom, they are happening in the relationships that exist. They're happening uh, outside the circle all the time. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a draw a question out from an existing one. Um, how are you doing this work in uh, the time of COVID? <laughs> how is, you know, is it still happening? Um, do you think it's, it's working as well virtually? Or are you sitting like 10 feet apart outside? I don't know. Um, just really quickly, we're, we're open to either. Um, I would prefer to do the 10 feet apart outside. I'm scheduling one in a couple of weeks with the 10 feet outside, if possible. Um, there are others that are happening through screens. And the real loss in doing it through screens is that, you know, a part of why we don't have a table in the middle of the circle is so that we can feel the full body language of the human all the, uh, sitting across from us. I, I, I find tapping feet and bouncing knees to be really important information. I also feel that like we get, dis we, we, we are in our heads when we're only seeing each other's heads, right? I'm even noticing in this call, like I'm answering questions from my head. Um, whereas when I'm with people, when I'm in your presence, I answer from my whole body, I answer from my heart. And so that's been really hard on Zoom. But another deep fear that people have is around confidentiality and recordings and things of that nature. So uh, that is, there are additional layers of trust we have to cut through uh, in the time of COVID. We're exclusively on Zoom right now and it works about as well as it can work and that's problematic. Yeah, it, uh, mostly in terms of privacy and um, just being with full human beings instead of images of human beings. Thank you. Uh, so we're at about time. So I do, if there's any, any closing remarks either of you wanna make, um, please let me know. Yes. Um, otherwise, oh, go ahead, Sujatha. Yeah, just really briefly, I would say, I really want to honor, I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, um, and that if there's some other way to, uh, you know, gather those and, and get information back, I'm happy to do so um, from my side. And then, you know, I just want to reiterate my deep um, gratitude for people who had uh, skepticism about the applicability of restorative justice to intimate partner violence. Um, those fears came from a good place. Uh, we don't want to reprivatize uh, sexual violence. We don't want to, um, uh, and, and we don't want to put people at risk, right? And um, the conflation of um, counseling, of 
uh, you know, let the family deal with it and what restorative justice is really needs to not happen. A restorative justice is an accountability approach. It is about uh, without being punitive, right? But it is still about accountability. So to participate, to be a part of this, we have to be thinking about uh, people who have caused harm being supported to understand that that is what is happening um, and to stop. And so, um, you know, I know that this is a stretch for folks um, and I, um, and, and those old fears are legit. Um, we want to make sure that we're not running out and, you know, appointing ourselves the new restorative justice and domestic violence expert by doing a 40 hour training in this and a circle training in that and then shoving it together and think that you know how to do this. Um, I would just encourage people going slowly, really starting with those focus groups, thinking about what's appropriate for your region, your area, uh, what is culturally appropriate for the folks that you're working with, um, and really building this uh, by and through community to teach us what is needed in order for this to end. So um, that's all I would say in closing. Um. Yeah, I got a bunch of things I would like to say. Um, I guess one, one of the, the, the ways in which I try to caution myself and other people who are first, especially first learning about restorative justice or restorative practices or circle-based practices, um, is if, you're, if your first question is, does it work? Um, what do you mean by that? And what are some broader ways to think about it? I don't, I don't think it's a, a bad question. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially if you have to have some kind of data uh, to get approval for whatever. But if if that's the, the the only question you have or the only one you can come up with in the moment, try to try to do some critical dialogue with other folks around what that means. What will it look like to you when it works, um, and what will it look like to to other folks? Because it's it's different from every perspective, and it's something we're we're trying to do with our program uh, all the time. Is is check multiple blind spots and perspectives. Well, thank you both so much. I think this was really wonderful and I'm really glad that we all had this opportunity to learn from both of you. Um, and I think, I think, I mean, seeing the comments, it's definitely inspired a lot of our listeners. So again, I really appreciate your time. I know you're both very busy. And I appreciate the time of our interpreters and our captioner as well. Um, thank you all for making this work. And as for everyone else, I will see you all next week. So bye-bye.